Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Muchas gracias. Thank you, too, to our uh, friends in Zoom. I was hoping I would see them all in like a, like a little column to the side of the screen, but um, um, I, I do have people that I know that are in Zoom, and so I, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, let me just make sure that this is fine, that you can hear me. Okay, great. And uh, so the purpose of this talk is to share with you how anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion have inspired the development of this certificate in data science for social impact and continue to inspire it. How they have shaped the way in which the curriculum is developed. And so uh, I, I will definitely appreciate all the questions, the comments that you might have at the end of the talk because we know that this is work that has to, you know, we have to learn from it day by day. We are, um, we have a huge uh, task in front of us, all of us. And so I, I want to mention that this is joint work. So I'm learning a lot from you as well as I share this with you. So I think we've all been, maybe a, through a loved one or directly have benefited from the increase in data technologies, especially like, you know, seeing that a, um, a tumor is detected early on just because of better medical imaging makes us all very hopeful for the use of data technologies, not just in, in medicine, but in other realms. And that uh, excitement has permeated at some point to social services with a belief that finally with data and objective use of data, uh, we will be able to address the needs of society and people that fall through, uh, you know, no, no uh, blame on their own, that fall through the cracks and, and need support. So in homelessness, housing instability, um, mental health issues, and yet I, I think it comes as not, not as a surprise to you, we know that uh, there's been incredible problems when trying to apply data technologies to address social issues. For instance, um, an algorithm that screens for child neglect could harden racial disparities. This is very recently, it's a very controversial um, use of data technologies to decide whether uh, a report of child neglect or maltreatment gets addressed or gets investigated. Um, we know that also the uh, decision making in allocating health services to people that have been uh, aided by algorithms sometimes have led to, without knowing, uh, excluding a large group of participants, particularly black patients, within a same insurance system from uh, services that were preventive. That, uh, in that case, thankfully, uh, there was an, a, an analysis that allowed to uh, identify that problem. This was an algorithm that had not used race as a variable in, 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 in the process, and yet, by other uh, circumstances because society carries racism, which then leads to data that carries this uh, s segregation um, led to those really biased results. And then we also have an example with police data. Again, you know, predictive policing has been so controversial and uh, clearly uh, skewed uh, towards uh, people of color. So what do we do with this? Do we say no to data, no to data algorithms? This is all, um, they carry the biases found in society and so it's going to be, you know, always problematic. And what we have done here at the Mandel School is to learn from the past to influence that future. I think, you know, more and more it's really exciting to see that uh, nascent scholarship in social science, in public health, are looking back and are um, trying to address 
these uh, issues. So our certificate, and uh, we have, thank you, Richard Sig in the audience who can tell you a little bit more about the application process, but what I can tell you is it is a 12 credit digitally certified certificate offered jointly by our school and the School of Engineering at here at CASE. I'm really excited to work with our colleagues in engineering and they are also excited to work with us. Um, with a point of integrating community knowledge into data science to advance social justice within an ethical framework. Maybe that would be kind of in a nutshell what we're doing. And why integrate community knowledge? How is that going to address ADEI? How is that going to maybe prevent our um, misuse of data? Well, it turns out that uh, a lot of the, the, the data science, the techniques that we use um, in, also in social sciences are really a, a sum of two things, data and assumptions. So the statistical models that we apply to data are really informed by a set of assumptions and the question is whose assumptions are those? Are these ones that the researcher you know, kind of decided that they would be, um, would be applicable to understanding this data. The examples that I presented in the previous slide all had wrong assumptions about the behaviors of people marginalized in society. And because of those misinformed assumptions, they were missing either um, people that should have received medical services, homeless services, or they were targeting people uh, with, with these uh, police algorithms. So th we think that it's really important to use information from uh, experiential knowledge, community knowledge, at the very beginning, not at the end to interpret results, but ra rather at the very beginning. And so that is how our curriculum is structured, with four classes uh, that can be taught, uh, can be attended in person or remote. Um, the first two classes, so you see the two in red are the uh, Mandel Schools classes, and the green ones are the ones offered in engineering. The green classes, uh, exploratory data science and modeling and prediction, are both obvious as it, their names indicate. They're going to teach us about the tools, the, the data um, techniques, the modeling techniques, the exploratory visualization, and that is important, right? But those tools are not enough. Uh, what we want to do is frame it with uh, a, uh, a framework uh, to integrate community knowledge, experiential knowledge, and historical knowledge of historical processes in it. Um, that is, uh, we explore a number of areas of social work and under this framework in the first class, the introduction to data science for social impact. And uh, in that second semester, we have a chance to implement it fully through a uh, analysis of data, where, as I said, we go through the um, now empowered with the tools and that framework, we can uh, implement it in, in a project of our choice. So the presentation today is going to be mainly about that framework and how we set up uh, the sequence. So that's SAS 471, which we are actually t uh, teaching this coming semester. I should say too that if you want to, um, if you know, as a student, you would like to just take that class for general reference, that is good. And, and also that this is geared to uh, Anyone with a bachelor's degree that might have had a class in statistics, we do have a boot camp in the summer for um, a review of those statistical, um, that statistical background, but it, it is not meant to make another data scientist out of us, rather to empower the data science building blocks with knowledge that you bring uh, that to the table. So I said looking back to the past, and this was uh, an opportunity for me to learn. I continue to learn about the past and how it informs our future and continue to be inspired by this. 
um, our former dean, Dr. Sharon Milligan, once called for a book club, um, invited us to a book club to read The Condemnation of Blackness by Dr. Khalil Gibran Mohammed. At the time, I was reading The Book of Why, uh, The New Science of Cause and Effect uh, by uh, Judea Pearl, computer scientist Judea Pearl. And uh, I thought, my, these two things go together in a beautiful way because both challenge this idea that data speaks for themselves and uh, point to a much better understanding of data if it is informed by knowledge, uh, historical knowledge of the society, of the way in which um, discrimination shapes that. And uh, Pearl provides beautiful, simple graphical tools in which we can make those assumptions explicit and we can all as a community kind of challenge those assumptions before we start interpreting data. So uh, I'll just read uh, a, a note from, from this book. The invisible layers of racial ideology packed into the statistics, sociological theories, and the everyday stories we continue to tell about crime in modern urban America are a legacy of the past. The choice about which narratives we attach to the data in the future, however, is ours to make. So what narratives do we attach to the data? And then uh, Pearl, at a recent interview, he says, data alone are hardly a science. No matter how big, he actually says data, big data are dumb data. <laughs> um, but um, in this interview, he, w he refrained himself. And, uh, no matter how big they get and how skillfully they are manipulated. So again, the idea of we, when we use a causal graph to set up our assumptions to clarify them and share them, then that, uh, along with data, might be able to uh, be more, more powerful. I want to say that it was, uh, it was painful, it was instructive, and it was inspiring to read The Condemnation of Blackness. And I have gone through it a number of times uh, because of the class that uh, we developed social data analysis and racism then and now. But most of all, I would say it was inspiring. And I, it allowed us to meet not only Dr. <laughs> well, not in person yet, <laughs> Dr. Khalil Gibran Mohammed in, right there in the center, but also amazing people that lived in the early 1900s um, up until, well, people that lived until just a few years ago continue to live, um, and that have used data in a different way. They challenged the way in which social science scholars that at the time in 1930, 40, and 50 were on the podiums of the academies, the national academies, uh, these scholars Challenge, and activists challenged the way in which data was used. They did not say, okay, data is not, not, like, not useful because it, it stems from a racialized society. They used data to challenge the flaws in logic that scholars had. And so that to me was incredibly inspiring and revealing. Uh, Ida B. Wells, uh, mathematician Kelly Miller, um, Fanny Williams, an activist who said at the time when there was a, unfortunately, a term for, for uh, the study of racism, it was called the Negro problem. And, uh, and, and she very uh, smartly pointed, that is not the problem, the problem is how does one navigate a system that has so many barriers that seems really so crazy, right? Um, and, and of course, as we know, um, Du Bois as well. So there was much to learn from looking at the past. Um, and only very recently in 2020, 2021, and 22 is that the um, American Economic Association, the Association of Social Workers, uh, the American Psychological Association, present some, some, some statements of recognizing their lack of knowledge, their lack of understanding, sometimes their um, 
apologies of the harm uh, performed. So this is just to say the, the, the things that I learned in statistics, that we learn in our statistics classes, if detached from the clarifying where those assumptions come for the models we run, uh, they were not advanced in social justice, we're not advanced in ADEI uh, when we omit them. Many of us, if, if we have you know, ever had to run a regression and we include a variable that classifies people by the so social construct of race, what do we mean by that? Have we you know, spent some time questioning the way in which it is used? And as a social worker, if you are uh, working with a client and you enter those uh, types of demographic characteristics, do we question what are they going to be used to? How are they going to inform our, our better performance as an agency? Oops, sorry. So, um, just want to make sure. So we are building resources uh, using a public interest technology grant to uh, inform t that, to infuse this certificate with community knowledge to help students critically examine and challenge assumptions by integrating community knowledge at the very beginning so that when they use administrative and publicly available data, they have a much more critical perspective on, on it. Um, to identify and address bias in data analysis, in causal and predictive modeling, and then also to uh, shape the analysis under uh, uh, principles of ethics and fairness. Our team is, is, is a nice, uh, diverse group of community partners, uh, community collaborators, people that with lived experiences that come not as a focus group participant, as a subject of research, but rather as a collaborator to inform our, our um, analysis of data. We have student collaborators and then uh, faculty members from uh, multiple schools. And this framework that I was referring to, FAIR, it stands for Frame, Articulate, Identify, and Report. Frame, we, we frame uh, the data and we uh, describe the meta, uh, metadata with historical context and experiential knowledge for which we use these data chats um, that uh, I'll explain a little bit about uh, in the next slide. With that information, we articulate into causal graphs uh, the questions, the research questions that we have uh, the hypotheses about the role of discrimination in the um, social issue being addressed. We take almost like a checklist approach to looking at each variable and trying to understand if there is any uh, bias embedded in that variable or in the uh, fact that maybe some observations are missing. Why are they missing? And then we report back, so originally the, the framing of the data uh, uses experiential knowledge, so our subject matter experts are people with lived experiences whose data is represented. And so then we report back to this group, to uh, members of the community or agencies that uh, can give us feedback. It's not just about reporting at an academic conference, um, as much as that is still very important. <laughs> So one example that we are currently exploring is the uh, recertification of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, SNAP. As you might know, it's one of the largest programs, social service programs in the United States. And it's been analyzed using administrative data multiple times. The thing is that every six or every six months or every year, people that qualify have to recertify again. And it has been shown that uh, about half of those that um, are enrolled in SNAP, by the first year, half have already dropped. And half of those who have dropped apparently would still qualify. And so what's going on with the problem and the, uh, the program and the process uh, that 
uh, makes people who qualify, who could, you know, use another hundred dollars for food, not be able to access that. So we embarked on this, uh, the first part of the framework, F, with my, one of my uh, partners of research, Emily Miller, is, uh, Emily <laughs> Nelson is here with me. Uh, we have uh, done these conversations with people. We have food and we, we, we talk as if we would do in, in a sobre mesa, in a, uh, just having lunch and then talking after lunch, right? And so we, we recognize that there's this data generating process, the administrative data that we see, they know much more about it than we do. So who entered the information you provided in the intake form when you, um, when you were applying or applying for risk certification of SNAP, were you offered, offered an explanation for the need to ask the questions you were asked? Do you think this data is necessary to provide appropriate services? Um, and so we engage in this discussion. We ask people for their advice. And that leads, as I said, to um, identification of important points uh, coming from that experiential knowledge, such as an obsolete communication system, hours long wait times on the phone, uh, stressful verification process that seems confrontational, um, and, and, and really deep and profound uh, thoughts that come from our participants saying that these services should come from a sense of mutual trust the natural state of humans is cooperation. If you're being combative, everyone rea reacts viscerally. They don't have enough people to intake, so you're discouraging people from applying. You know when you set a goal and you try to make it and you fail? That's how I feel. It's a defeated feeling. There's nothing I can do, nobody who can help you. So, it's kind of uh, sounds a little strange that we go from those uh, important thoughts to a graphical model. But I just want to point here two things. So this very simple uh, model that you have here, where FR is failure to recertify, would be analyzed in the standard way, where we put multiple variables in a model and we predict, is this person go, is is that person at risk to fail recertification? Where race is just one more variable that we unquestionably enter in this model. That other uh, graph comes from thinking about the historical processes that shape discrimination uh, that then impact the contemporary policy, policies that allocate scarce resources through the social safety net, so that's CP. The way in which, rather than race, we have MG there, the classification into a marginalized group that then leads to stigmatization and that leads to um, a number of other factors like poverty, time and resource scarcity that ultimately affect failure to recertify. The point being is that if we see the system in a more realistic way, informed by experiential knowledge, we're going to be much more careful when we analyze variables, like the, the, the model used in just race as a variable and in the way in which we not only set up models but interpret results. I'll just very quickly say that we do uh, learn also from going step by step on that checklist to identify, this is FAI, identify uh, potential biases in the data, uh, missing uh, data patterns, and, um, and the reporting is yet to come because we are meeting with our data chat participants in a couple of weeks, and so we will see how things go with them. Uh, but in general, in, in this first class, we cover uh, and analyze the literature, very recent literature, on the use of force by police, incarceration and bail, child welfare, homeless services, health services, and um, recently with our work on housing and lead effects research. We, uh, we allow students to focus on their interests 
any uh, areas in which data technologies are being used for uh, decision making to improve um, social services is, is something that we um, you know, allow students to take on. I, I also want to point out that just like I had this beautiful picture of um, scholars, activists that are less, uh, that are not surfaced in our, in our knowledge of contributions to social sciences, and yet should be. Uh, today, young and alive, we have uh, amazing black scholars as well. Uh, I have drawn and my colleagues and I have drawn f for this uh, work on um, two important groups of uh, scholars in epidemiology pointing to teaching yourself about structural racism will improve your machine learning. Recommendations for using causal diagrams to study racial health disparities. Uh, so we're really excited to see that this is this is work that others, you know, are also uh, developing. And when when it comes to when it comes to touching on on issues that are so um, so important and so personal, and I when I say personal, I mean every one of us, right? In a society where wherever we are, not necessarily in the United States, but where there is marginalization of of people then um, I, I think that it's really uh, helpful to draw from the literature, to draw from the arts. So I wanted to, you can read in case you know it's not, the audio isn't the best, but this is uh, an, one of my heroes, Winton Marsalis, trumpetist and, and uh, I would say philosopher. So here he goes, this was years ago when he was asked about, about race and this was for a jazz documentary by Ken Burns. Well, race is a race is like for this country it's like uh the thing in the story in the mythology that you have to do for the kingdom to be well, and it's always something you don't want to do. And it's always that thing that's so much about you confronting yourself that is tailor-made for you to fail dealing with it. And the question of your heroism and of your courage and of your, of your success at dealing with this trial is can you confront it with honesty? And do you confront it and do you have the energy to sustain an attack on it? So I leave you with uh, the courage that it Winton Marsalis inspires us to uh, follow.